Hey travelers, electrical fires. They can be scary and they seem to be often poorly understood. So I think it bears a discussion. Let's have a little chat about the risks that contribute to an increased risk of an issue. What you can do to help mitigate those risks. Overwhelmingly, it's actually pretty simple, but there are a lot of nuances here. So I'll talk more or less about the high level stuff and maybe you can use this information to apply it to your own situation. But first, a lot of people look at things like this. They say, oh, look, these wires, they run into an extension lead. That's a fire risk. I've had a lot of people tell me that this is a fire risk. I'm not really entirely sure why, but that's what they say. But there is points worth talking about on something like that that I think aren't really well understood. In mining rigs, a lot of times you have a lot of wires flapping in the breeze like this. And I even have these bundled together, which a lot of people will say is a fire risk. We'll talk about whether or not this is and how much it matters and these sorts of deals. Now, first and foremost, the overwhelming majority of issues with electrical fires, at least in residential applications, almost always is electrical resistance. And there's a lot of ways electrical resistance can cause issues. So it really requires a pretty significant in-depth discussion. I'll try to limit it <laughs> as best I can so it's you know applicable and understandable. But first and foremost, I think the regular wall outlets are a good place to start. People look at these and say, there's power here. There's power here. There's power there. What's the difference? It actually is a difference because these are all fed up the same circuit. And what that means is typically, at least in North America and a lot of parts of the world, you have a main panel somewhere and there'll be a wire coming out of that, a connection to the breaker, a connection to the neutral, the ground and stuff like that into there, going into the outlet. And in the back of the outlet, there's the two connections for the power, then it goes out with two more connections into a new outlet, two more connections, and it jumpers, jumpers, jumpers over and over. And these outlets could have a dozen or so connections. And just by looking at it, you don't know where you are in that chain. It could be, this is the end of the line, it could be the first one. And every one of those connections isn't an issue. If they're good, no problem, doesn't matter. The risk is every one of those connections has a chance to be bad. And if you haven't examined the system, if you don't check, if you're not going around with a thermal camera while the system is under load, you don't know. You honestly can't tell. There really isn't a great way to test for that without loading the system and checking. There are tools you can get, something like this. This will give you a estimate of the voltage drop, the impedance, the uh, electrical resistance at the outlet. And it's not a bad tool. You can use it to go from an outlet to another outlet. And you can typically actually see whether or not there's an additional piece of wire and connections from this outlet to this outlet. You can kind of guesstimate whether or not this outlet is the first, the second, the third, the fourth. This tool is oftentimes sensitive enough for that, depending on the situation. So it's cool for that. And of course, you always want to minimize the resistance, not intrinsically because of the resistance being lower, but because the lower resistance tends to increase, it tends to indicate Reduce number of connections, reduce the length of wire, reduce the risk. Typically, the issues are the connections, almost always, almost overwhelmingly. The wire in the wall very rarely has a problem. Sometimes you get a staple in it or something like that, or it's abrading on something that chafes. It'll short out. You get a series fault, a parallel fault. Those are kind of hard to mitigate. They really honestly are, unless you get like an arc fault circuit breaker. But they're kind of expensive, and it could be an issue to retrofit into some homes, depending on what panel you have. And... I think it's a bit out of the scope of this video. We'll mainly talk about the DC stuff, the things you have a bit more control over. The AC side, AC side of things can be a little bit more complex, a lot of nuance there. But the thing to remember is the connections are massively increased risk. The wire length itself, honestly, really isn't really big of a deal. Sometimes you'll have an issue with it, but it's very rare to have an issue with the wire. It's usually an issue with the load or the connector. Sometimes you'll see people with something like this, PCA cables, and the wire melts. And it looks like, well, surely it was an issue with the wire. Maybe. It may have been there was an issue somewhere downstream. Maybe the connector melted and the wires touched and shorted, causing the wire to get too much current flowing through it, and it melted. And, you know, all you see is what happened after the fact. So all you know is the wire melted. You don't know what happened first. Or something happened inside the car, a fault happened inside there, and this wire couldn't handle the fault current, and it melted. Because one thing that to keep in mind is with most consumer power supplies, of course, including server power supplies, 
This power supply, if you have a 1500 watt power supply, every one of these connectors has the full power available to it. It doesn't know, it doesn't have any protection. There's no isolation. A lot of consumer ATX power supplies are the very same way. Every line has full power available. So there is increased risk with higher power power supplies. Um, now, some of them will have protection, they'll isolate them and stuff like that. It depends on the wattage. The higher the wattage, the more likely this is. But it doesn't happen with server power supplies. So there is a risk intrinsic with very high power server power supplies. And it's one of the reasons I would try and avoid them if you can. But that's the reason why I have this wired the way I do. Because you look at this, and you know this is something to keep in mind and consider. These are 750 watt power supplies plugged into a screw terminal breakout board. Every one of those terminals has the full 62 and a half rated amps of this. And it'll actually put out more than that. It'll put out 140, 150% before it actually turns off. So it'll put out way more than that into a fault, potentially, but probably for a short duration. So that means every one of these wires has the potential for full power out of this power supply to come out of it. They're not fused or protected. And actually increasing the size of the wire, what it can do is it can increase the current you get into a fault. And that could sound like a bad thing, but it could be a good thing. Because what will happen is if you have a good enough fault, if the short is really clean, if you get a really good low impedance path, this will just go way over current really, really fast and almost no heating will occur and it'll just trip off. You, you won't even notice. The risk is when you have a high resistance fault and a lot of current is flowing through that resistance. That's when you get heating. Typically heating takes time. It's very difficult in a consumer setting to get a lot of heat to melt the wire and cause fires fast. It's very unlikely. Usually it takes time. So usually what happens is your system works fine, operates normal, everything looks cool. But what happens is the connection gets bad over time. Something changes, something shifts, whatever. It wears out. You unplug it and replug it a million times and the connector gets worn out, causes heating. The power flowing through that bad connection causes additional heating. Well, you know, the, the current flowing through the resistance is what causes the heating. So on things like this, these connectors have a limited insertion cycle. They could only be plugged in and removed, plugged in and removed so many times, and that's because of their design. They're designed to squeeze onto the little wire bits. They have a, there's a connector in there it's designed to squeeze onto. The harder it squeezes, the better the connection. Typically, and that's because of the more surface area that actually touches. Like it might look like one's round, the other's round, and you know, they, they touch really well. It's not really true. Electrically, only a few points are going to make contact. And if they have really rough surfaces, if they're really abrasive, if the pins are misaligned and things like this, when you plug them in and remove, they get damaged, they, they lose tension, they have worse and worse connection over time. So the thicker wire on these may reduce the fire risk, but it really typically isn't because of the resistance change in this section. It's because it'll sink the heat away from here a little bit better. So any of the heat caused from here will wick into the wire a little bit. So typically this is your hottest section, the connector and then the little bit next to it. Out here, pretty low risk. Like a lot of times you can bundle these together, and especially if you have a fanboy. Not, like it, it really isn't significant risk. But you do need to understand the cards are going to load these plugs differently. Some load the slot heavily, some load this connector heavily, some load this connector heavily, some load them all evenly. Without something like an Elmore Labs PNB, you don't know. But generally speaking, NVIDIA cards don't put a lot of load on the slot. They put all their load on one or multiple of the PCIe connectors. So you do want to understand that it does matter where you plug things in. If you're going to use splitters on something like this, which I would avoid because it increases the number of connections you have, and of course it runs the potential for double the current through the primary one that leads into the splitter. If you're going to use splitters, only use it if you know the power consumption of the thing you're plugging it into. I'm not saying know the power consumption of the card. That's irrelevant. Know the power consumption of this plug under your load because it varies. This plug probably consumes different power than this plug. On this card, I know, in fact, that's the case. Most of these cards, that's true. However, if you know, like if you're smart enough to be able to measure these things, know when you're trying to save a nickel or whatever, it is pretty safe to run a splitter if you know the power is low enough, if you know you have enough safety factor. So on something like this, the riser power, on uh, these cards in particular, these plugs are running very, very low power, the ones that actually power the slot. So it would be very safe to run one of those on a splitter, but you would only really know that by measuring it. If you don't measure it, I wouldn't take the risk. Run a separate wire to everything, but also be aware, every one of these wires has the potential for the full power. So as the power supply current goes up, as the power, power supply 
power goes up, you have increased potential because every one of these, if it gets pinched, rubbed, shorted, chafed against something, you can get a fault between the positive and the negative. And usually the faults aren't super clean. They're a little, they're a little gritty or they're, they have a high resistance and it'll cause heating. So of course, be aware if the wires get pinched in something in a cabinet, in an enclosure, in between cards, multitude of things, that's a risk. And of course, if you unplug and replug these a million times, they'll get worn out. You really should replace them. And if the little clippy things break off that latch these on, you should consider replacement and just trash the thing because what could happen is it could be yanked out a little bit and it's not fully inserted, you get a bad connection. All right, there's a lot of factors like that to consider with electrical safety. Um, and you really gotta consider all facets. The electrical safety is only as good as the weakest link, like everything, right? So everything could be amazing, but if you have one thing that's not good, well, <laughs> of course, it's still a risk, right? It doesn't go away magically because everything else is good. Something that's often overlooked are on these C13 connectors, the IECs. Inside here, there's actually little spring contacts inside this molded end. So these also have a finite amount of insertion removal cycles. These, because these are solid pins, it doesn't matter that much how many times you remove and insert. Um, now, the plating on here will wear over time, but typically it isn't really a big factor. It's not really something to worry about. But if you unplug and replug these in violently a bunch of times, it will wear and you will measurably increase the resistance. And again, consider the risk. This is a 750 watt power supply being driven off 240 volts. So the current flowing through here, it's a few amps. This is made for, say, 13, 15 amps or so, somewhere around there. Um, I guess 12 amps would be the rated code number in North America. So three amps out of 12, that's not bad. That's a pretty good amount of overhead. Um, but if you were running a much higher wattage supply on here, you may want to consider running a thicker wire because usually the thicker wire will have a better connector with higher tension. It may not, but it typically does. And on top of that, the thicker wire will help pull heat out of the connection, the hot spot. And one other option, if you're really concerned, is a thermal camera. A thermal camera is great. They can be kind of costly, but you can get them sort of inexpensively now. I like plugging your phone. And you go around with the system fully loaded, running for a while so everything's hot, hopefully, and you look. You look at everything. Is anything hot? Is anything unusually hot? Um, if anything looks suspicious, touch it. Because the thermal cameras, they don't compensate for what's called emissivity, how the device radiates the... Um, Okay, I guess we're getting into involved here. But different surfaces will radiate the thermal energy differently and the camera will pick it up differently. So some reflective objects and different materials will radiate differently. You could get false readings. So always try and verify if you can, unless it's actually really hot. Um, but something to keep in mind there. So you gotta watch out for reflective surfaces that could give you bad readings, but you could put like electrical tape on them or something. Yeah, so anyways, the primary thing is always consider the number of connections, try to minimize them. Try to understand these factors. Try to avoid the use of splitters and unnecessary things. But be aware, things like this can actually be very dangerous because these may not be compliant for what you're doing with it. You could buy extension cords like this that are 18 gauge and plug them into your outlet. And you think, well, it's a 15 amp outlet. It's good for it. But this is good for 1,200 watts or 1,000 watts or something like that. And it'll typically have like a label on it. Well, I guess they're all ripped off on here. They'll typically have one of these warning labels that'll tell you, hey, don't run more than this power through it. But, you know, nobody really looks at it. They just rip it off or whatever. So it is something to consider. Um, and, of course, inside here, there's connections. There's little spring connections. So this has the same issue as everything else. This is almost always your weak link, not the actual wire itself. Inside here, you will get wear every time you unplug, replug, unplug, replug, just like these. And over time, you will get higher contact resistance. You will get worse performance. You get more heating. And the heating only occurs when power is flowing through it. So as long as you have low enough power, it doesn't really matter. But it's always like a, it's a risk factor. The higher the power relative to the absolute capacity, the design capacity, generally the higher the risk. The lower the power, sort of the lower the risk. So best thing you can do is overbuild, but it does help to understand the factors because then you can know where to spend, where not to. Sometimes you're, it doesn't really matter if you overbuild in certain areas. 
um, because the power running through this particular thing, it's so low it's irrelevant, right? Like getting 14 gauge for your risers may matter a lot on something like A2000s where all the powers run through the risers. Well, I should guess I should have 16 gauge. You may want to get 16 gauge PCIe cables for something like A2000s, especially with shunt mounted because they're running at high power. Now on something like most 30 series, typically the risers run at very low power. So you could get away with 18 gauge all day. No issues, no they'll run at so low power. You could even put them on a splitter usually, but I would always verify first with something like a Elmore Labs PMD or meter or something, a clamp meter. But yeah, things to consider, things to keep in mind. Um, yeah, a lot of times the things people say are fire risks really aren't, but there's a, quite a few things out there that people don't think are fire risks, but are. So always consider how much power is flowing through it, because um, without the current flow, you don't get heating. Yeah, I don't know. Hope that helps you out. If you have any further questions, please let me know. Comments below. I'll try and answer them, but <laughs> I tried to be as simple as feasible. Um, it is a very complex topic, so there's a lot of things I missed. But yeah, if you have any comments, I'd like to do a video on in the future. But until next time, stay hashing.